Today I'm going to talk about acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, which obviously is something we've been dealing with quite a bit in the last couple of years with the COVID pandemic. Um, so we'll dig into kind of some of the history behind the diagnosis and then go through current management and kind of an evidence-based approach uh, through the current management of ARDS. So this is just the outline of what I'll talk about today. So we'll start with an overview and then kind of the history of ARDS and, the, and go on to the current definition of ARDS and then touch on pathogenesis and then uh, delve into treatment and management. And then I can't really talk about this topic now without uh, touching on COVID, so we'll do that. Uh, and then finish up with kind of future directions and, and treatments, et cetera. <clears throat> All right. so. ARDS, uh, first defined back in 1967, um, as many diagnoses were. Uh, they started uh, back in the past with a historical description of a cohort of patients. And in this case, it was David Ashbaugh describing 12 patients with respiratory failure and bilateral infiltrates. And really it was due to a variety of different triggers, ranging from polytrauma to viral pneumonia to fat embolism syndrome. The histopathology of these patients showed a similar process of alveolar edema collapse in hyaline membranes. And he noted that PEEP or positive end expiratory airway pressure significantly helped uh, the hypoxemia. Uh, and this is, you can see here is the description. It was originally published in the Lancet, uh, but only 12 patients. So it wasn't really until 1994 uh, that there was a, the first formal definition of ARDS was uh, established. And prior to this, there were a variety of different uh, less formal uh, descriptions and diagnostic criteria. But 94 uh, marked the um, American European Consensus Conference definition, which is important to at least know about because it's used in some of the clinical uh, trials that we'll talk about. Um, and they broadly defined ARDS as a syndrome of inflammation uh, and increased permeability that is associated with the constellation of clinical radiographic physiologic abnormalities that cannot be explained by, but may coexist with left atrial or pulmonary capillary hypertension. Um, so this table goes through two different criteria uh, from this definition. The first was the ALI criteria uh, or acute lung injury criteria, which was basically a less severe version of, um, of ARDS. Uh, and then the ARDS criteria, which is a more severe uh, version. Both were acute, hence the name acute. <laughs> uh, both, and then the PDF uh, for ALI was defined as less than 300. So this is just the ratio of your arterial oxygenation to the inspired oxygenation. And they didn't have any PEEP threat thresholds. Um, and then you had to have bilateral infiltrates. And then they actually used a pulmonary artery wedge pressure uh, in the definition of less than 18 for both ALI and ARDS. So essentially, by, by adding this pulmonary wedge pressure, they were excluding or trying to exclude um, heart failure as um, a, a cause or compounding factor in um, the bilateral infiltrates. However, there were some there, there were some areas or issues with this definition. It was a little bit vague, at least in terms of uh, the timing of acute was not necessarily defined, um, and you also had to have this invasive pulmonary artery wedge pressure measurement to, to fulfill this definition, which historically was used frequently, but currently uh, not used. Okay. And then in 2012 uh, came along the Berlin definition. This was published in JAMA. Um, this, is, again, is another consensus definition between European and American groups. Um, it kind of expands on the um, initial definition. They define uh, acute as timing within one week <coughs> um, of a known insult or worsening respiratory symptom. And then, again, bilateral opacities, but they have this caveat 
not fully explained by effusions, uh, atelectasis, or nodules. And then the origin of edema cannot be explained by cardiac uh, failure or volume overload. Um, and they have this uh, statement that you need some objective assessment and echo, but somewhat vague, but they mentioned the echocardiogram is, is, uh, is okay to exclude, um, exclude this if um, edema um, is present. And then they have, uh, they divide it into mild, moderate, and severe based on the P to F ratio, and they have a minimum PEEP um, of five. Okay, so that's, this is the current definition and, and what we use um, and what we'll use going forward. I'd be cautious just to be aware of ARDS mimics because as the definition um, uh, says that you, you have to exclude other things such as atelectasis or nodules. So you might look at this radiograph and if someone's on a lot of oxygen, you might say this looks like ARDS. But if you look closely, you can see that these opacities are fairly well, um, or, or, or nodule, or appear nodular, um, and are relatively diffuse. But the CT scan again shows diffuse, what we call cannonball metastases um, and nodular lesion lesions. So this would not be ARDS. This would be metastatic um, cancer. Um, but it could look like um, ARDS if you just look at the plate film. So just beware of the mimics because they're not going to be treated the same way, essentially. All right, so ARDS pathogenesis um, can be broadly divided as being caused by a direct or indirect injury. Um, so a direct lung injury would be something like uh, pneumonia or aspiration that is, uh, that is uh, affecting the lung itself. Uh, and this is just a list of those things, so pneumonia, aspiration, contusion from trauma, inhalation injuries, near drowning, et cetera, and then indirect lung injury. Um, so this is where something that's not affecting the lung directly is, is leading to ARDS. And, and generally, it's something that's going to cause a, a profound SERS response, so from sepsis to um, pancreatitis to major burns to trauma. Um, transfusion, et cetera, can be associated with ARDS. So it's always important to think about what the cause is and if it's indirect or direct. And the, the pathogenesis of ARDS can be broadly de defined in three phases. There's the acute exudative phase, um, and the proliferative phase, and then the, the fibrotic phase, which can occur weeks later. So this diagram just depicts the exudative phase of ARDS. Um, so it all starts with some uh, injury, whether that's a direct injury or a indirect injury, and this leads to activation of the alveolar macrophages, which release a variety of inflammatory uh, cytokines and um, messengers, uh, and then converts the macrophage into an inflammatory macrophage and then you can have these cascading effects of um, neutrophil migration, um, and then, in a, which, and then uh, the neutrophils can release a variety of reactive oxygen species, or uh, elastase, uh, neutrophil, uh, neutrophil nets, which can cause um, surfactant to uh, be inactivated, and then um, you can get ultimately get this uh, protein-rich edema and then there's also association with uh, intravascular coagulation occurring in the pulmonary capillary beds. So um, basically this exudative phase is, is the, the inflammatory phase, the activation of the uh, inflammatory response, which is somewhat uh, dysregulated and leads to um, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but also some vascular uh, complications as well. <clears throat> All right, so this slide shows the onto the proliferative phase, which um, again is after the exudative phase. Um, this is several days to weeks later. Um, you have this um, recruitment basically of fibroblasts um, that come in and, um, and then ultimately leads to the fibrotic phase where you have extensive proliferation of fibroblasts and these myofibroblasts which can lead to fibrosis and scarring uh, down the road. 
Um, so ARDS, um, although it occurs acutely, is, has a prolonged, um, uh, basically a prolonged illness afterwards, subsequently with, with all three of these phases. And sometimes there can be some intermixing where some, some areas of the lung may be more fibrotic where others are still in the proliferative phase or in the exudative phase, et cetera. <laughs> so the, the board answer uh, to the pathology on ARDS is going to be diffuse alveolar damage, um, which is defined by alveolar edema, hemorrhage, and hyaline membrane formation, um, which you can see here um, in the top picture in the acute phase, you can see these thickened uh, highly membranes and then um, it's really the architecture of the lung is somewhat distorted. There's edema in the, um, in the alveolar space. And then B is the organizing phase where you see more fibroblasts and um, collagen deposition and really total uh, destruction of the normal lung architecture. However, despite um, this being the board answer question, um, both the Berlin and the, the American European consensus definitions lack specificity for uh, diffuse alveolar damage. So if you take a bunch of patients that, that fulfill the Berlin criteria and then actually do lung biopsies, only a small percentage of them actually have diffuse alveolar damage. So in the, in, for instance, in severe ARDS, only 60% of those patients, this was an autopsy series, only 60% have uh, DAD. Um, and some have just ammonia, others have other findings, and some, interestingly enough, have no pulmonary lesions. So some have criticized both these definitions for lacking uh, specificity um, for ARDS. And others have suggested that, that just this just means that ARDS is a very heterogeneous disease. but um, but I think somewhat interesting, just something to keep in mind. One thing we should know is how do ARDS patients actually die? Uh, you know, ARDS unfortunately is a very, very morbid condition with mortality ranging from 30 to 60%. Um, most patients don't die of respiratory failure, they die of shock, especially those with mild to moderate ARDS. Uh, and then a smaller percentage of those die uh, from refractory hypoxemia, so something uh, just to keep in mind. All right, so moving on to treatment, uh, there's a few um, goals of ARDS treatment. The number one goal is uh, really preventing further harm or lung injury or ventilator-induced lung injury, uh, which is known as VILI or B-I-L-I, and then maintain a normal range of oxygen and maintain a somewhat normal acid base. But I'd say the number one goal really is preventing further in, uh, injury. Uh, the point of the ventilator is not to get the lung better, it's to allow the lung to rest and, and heal on its own without causing further harm. This is the, so this is kind of a busy slide, but this is the ARDS or the ARDSnet um, mechanical ventilation protocol, which we used a lot back when I was a resident. I think it's somewhat fallen out of favor, but this has your overall goals for the treatment and management of ARDS. So first they have the criteria here, then they have your ventilator set up, and then they have uh, your oxygenation goals. So this is something important to keep in mind. Our PaO2 should rate our goals between 55 and 80. It doesn't have to be 100. Uh, it doesn't have to be 90. It can be somewhere within this range. So your SAT can be between 88 and 95 percent. And then we do allow, um, this, it does go into this on this slide, but permissive hypercapnia as well. So you don't have to have a perfect ABG. Um, and then it, we'll, we'll talk more about plateau pressures uh, moving forward. All right. So this is kind of how I think of the hierarchy of treatments in ARDS. And we'll talk about each of these individually and kind of some of the literature behind them. Um, I think the number one and two things are lung protective ventilation. So we'll define that and, and go through the studies in a second. Uh, proning, conservative fluid management. Uh, we'll talk about optimal, finding optimal PEEP, not using a PEEP table, but uh, using uh, the ventilator and individual patient factors. Uh, neuromuscular blockade, 
uh, would be lower down the list along with pulmonary vasodilators like Flolan, epoprosinol, uh, nitric oxide, etc. And then steroids in ECMO. All right, so what is lung or what is lung protective uh, ventilation? So the, the idea behind lung protective ventilation is you're, you're reducing the pressures and forces on the lung that are delivered by the ventilator. And by doing that, you're preventing um, a ventilator-induced uh, injury. So the, this was first studied uh, way back in 2000. Uh, and, and this was the ARDSnet trial, which was published in uh, New England Journal. Uh, they randomized 861 patients to a tidal volume of 12 cc's per kg of ideal body weight versus six cc's, or really six to eight cc's uh, per kilogram ideal body weight. And they, their primary outcome was mortality. Um, and you, thinking back, you, I think 12 cc's um, uh, per kilogram uh, tidal volume seem enormous to us. You know, you think about a 70 kilogram person, you know, that's gonna, approach you know one liter tidal volumes which is kind of crazy to think about that but um, by doing this they were able to uh, to see a difference and th this is a confusing graph but this is from the study itself um, so one the top curves are survival um, and you can see survival was significantly higher uh, in the uh, uh, the lower tidal volume group and then survival to um, discharge was also higher um, in the uh, traditional, or the, sorry, the lower tidal volume uh, group. And this is really what led to the adaptation of um, uh, low tidal volume and the so-called lung protective uh, ventilation that we use today. Um, all right. There have been studies to look at smaller differences, like the difference between eight and or six and eight or six and ten, um, but uh, they're harder to find than absolute difference, um, possibly because there is less absolute difference, and you need you need an enormous study to, to see a difference in, in you know between a six and an eight cc tidal volume. But the, overall, the the studies that, that have come after this, there has been a gradual or at least a, a numeric improvement in, um, in survival, um, but not statistically significant with lower and lower tidal volumes. Okay. All right, so moving on to proning uh, in ARDS, which I think if anyone's been in the ICU recently, they probably have at least one patient uh, with COVID that's been proned. Um, I would say by, besides lung protective or low tidal volumes, this is the number, um, you know, one of the top things you can do to help uh, patients survive ARDS. So the, the original study or the study that um, the current guidelines are based on was called the PERCEVA uh, trial. And this was uh, 466 patients with severe ARDS. So they had um, uh, PDFs less than 150. Um, They're randomized. And then they prone for at least 16 hours per day. And they continued proning them um, until their P to F improved greater than 150, while supine for four hours. So they most of the patients were proned uh, and unproned multiple times uh, in the study. And the only reason they stopped proning was if they if um, they became unstable um, while um, while they were proned or uh, or during the proning procedure itself. Okay, so this is the um, Kaplan-Meier survival curve, and you can see a significant uh, improvement in survival in the prone group compared to the supine uh, group. Um, it really more significant or a larger absolute difference than was seen in the low versus high tidal volume study. So proning is, I think, an essential um, treatment for ARDS and, and really anyone with ARDS the question should be not who to prone, but who not to prone. Um, one thing that, that sometimes comes up is this idea of response to proning. And by response, I mean improvement in, or transient improvement in their PDF while they're proned. Um, and sometimes that, I think that makes us feel better. You know, you prone someone and, and they're all of a sudden they're, they're 
their stats uh, 99 instead of 94. Um, but um, that shouldn't, uh, or I guess lack of response rather, should not dissuade you from continuing uh, to do proning. So um, there was, um, Albert et al. did a reanalysis of the PERCEVA trial, and they found that in the patients who uh, were proned, um, or the, the patients that had an improvements um, in hypoxemia with proning, that did not predict survival. So essentially the people that did not have transient improvements in hypoxemia did just as well or better than those who, um, who uh, did not. So basically um, the message is, keep proning even if people aren't responding, uh, i.e. They're, they're not having improvements in their PDEP. Just keep doing it because it, it probably will help otherwise. All right, why does proning help? Um, so there's probably a couple, no one knows for sure, but there's a couple of theories. Uh, one is the distribution of ARDS um, is classically in this uh, anterior to uh, posterior distribution of um, lung opacity. So you can see on this image here, that they have well to, relatively well aerated lung anteriorly. And then as you go posterior, there's this gradient to more and more consolidation. Uh, and perhaps when you prone them, um, you're perfusing this better aerated lung um, and, and, and have better VQ matching. Uh, and that's improving your hypoxemia. And then uh, in by using gravity, you're also potentially recruiting more lung here. Uh, and then perhaps um, you're distributing the tidal volume more equally across the lung and reducing over distension and under distension and, and therefore less uh, lung in injury from the ventilator. So this, is, this was a study um, from uh, ATS Journal. Um, and this just looked at CT imaging of prone and uh, supinated patients. So on the top, you see this is a patient that's supine and they had these posterior consolidations, um, you know, which can be characteristic of ARDS. And then uh, when they, uh, when they um, prone them, you can see that these infiltrates improve quite considerably. And their, their theory was that you're, again, that you're aerating this consolidated <clears throat> lung better and you're distributing that, that tidal volume um, more equally across the lung rather than just the whole tidal volume is going up here, um, it's going to the entire lung. Okay. All right, so um, moving on to uh, optimal PEEP. So um, I think PEEP comes up a lot in ARDS research. There's been a lot of studies looking at empiric high PEEP versus low PEEP. And really, these haven't shown a mortality uh, benefit in ARDS. Um, there was a reanalysis uh, of multiple ARDS trials with greater than 3,500 patients that showed that PEEP, that titrating PEEP to a minimal driving pressure, and we'll, touch, we'll talk about this in a second, was associated with lower mortality. So finding an optimal PEEP, or a PEEP where the driving pressure is minimized, you have lower mortality. So what is driving pressure? All right, so this um, slide, has, this shows a picture of a, um, basically a bent, a bent waveform where the, the um, what, uh, X axis here is airway pressure and Y is time. And then the, you know, as airway pressure goes up, that's when the tidal volume is delivered. Uh, and then this is uh, the expiratory phase and airway pressures come down. So if you were to deliver an entire, an entire tidal volume and then hold that volume, you basically take a breath in and then hold it in and measure that pressure, that's your plateau pressure. So essentially the plateau pressure is the amount of pressure that it takes to deliver uh, or hold uh, um, the lung at um, end expiration. Basically if you think of the lung as a balloon, you're inflating the balloon and at the end of uh, inflation, you're just holding still no more inflation and you're measuring that pressure, the, basically that distending pressure of the balloon or the lung. And uh, the plateau pressure is related to the compliance of the lung. So if you remember, compliance is the change in volume for the change in pressure. Um, and then you're adding um, 
which I think I have this out. Yeah. Um, and then you add the PEEP on top of that, and that's your plateau pressure. So the driving pressure is essentially the difference between your plateau pressure and your PEEP pressure. So again, it's the distent, think of it as the distending pressure of the lung or the pressure that it takes to keep the balloon inflated uh, once the entire tidal volume is uh, minimized or is delivered. And by minimizing this pressure, um, uh, that means less mechanical power and work uh, are going into the lung and less, potentially less ventilator injury. Um, okay. All right, so how do you find, how does plateau pressure change and how do you find the op uh, optimal PEEP? So this is another, this is a, a compliance curve of the lung. Um, and um, this is the lung at low, uh, low volumes. And as um, pressure increases, obviously the uh, volume increases and you want, you basically want the lowest compliance. So you want the, the, um, the biggest change in volume per unit pressure. So the steepest part of the line. So you want, you want to be inflating the lung in this portion of the curve as opposed to this portion or this, per, uh, uh, this portion of the curve. So for instance, if you started down here, say your peep, your starting peep was one, the lung is mostly, maybe mostly clapped and atelectatic, and then you deliver some pressure and your volume only goes up to here. So you're not getting very, very good tidal volumes. Or if you're in a volume control mode, you might start here and then go all the way up to here. So big delta in your pressure. If you were to move your starting point or your peep up along to here or above the lower inflection point, you're at a more steep portion of the curve and then your compliance is enhanced. So for minimal or, or lower changes in pressure, you're getting greater changes in tidal volume. And the same thing can be true on the far end of the curve. If you're over distended, um, the lung is stiff and filled with air, and then as you're delivering uh, higher and higher amounts of pressure, you're getting very little changes in volume. So basically, the, the optimal peep is, is where the starting point along this curve where the line is steepest, where you get the biggest volume change in volume per unit pressure, or in other words, the compliance is greater. Okay, so how can you find this on, in a patient? All right, well, this, this we'll talk about in a second, but this just shows that plateau pressures and uh, driving pressures is, is strongly related to mortality, which we kind of already talked about. All right, so how do you find this optimal PEEP? So there's a few ways, but probably the simplest way is something called a PEEP titration. Um, so this is where you, you have a starting point of PEEP, say a PEEP of eight, and then you're measuring plateau pressures at each peak. So you start at eight, you do an end or inspiratory hold and you measure your plateau pressure. And then the difference between the two is your driving pressure. And then you go up a little bit on your peak and you do the same thing. You measure your plateau pressure. And then again, calculate your driving pressure. You keep going 12, 14, 16, et cetera. And basically you're trying to find the point where the driving pressure is minimalized. So the the lowest number, the lowest driving pressure, and you're keeping tidal volume the same. The lowest driving pressure means the best compliance. So you can do this really on any patient with ARDS. They have to be sedated or paralyzed, um, so they can't be breathing over the vent. But this is something that we do uh, for pretty much every patient that's intubated. The first thing you can do is a PEEP titration and find this optimal PEEP. And I think one thing that we'll, we'll talk about COVID a little bit. All right, so I want to mention transpulmonary pressure because you might hear about this. This is kind of a research, more of a research topic. Um, they use it more in hospital center as well. But transpulmonary pressure is kind of a surrogate for driving pressure, but it's the, the difference between um, your alveolar pressure, which is roughly equivalent to your plateau pressure and your pleural pressure. So this is like the pressure that's uh, that's uh, across the lung itself. Um, and 
the idea is that you want to minimize this pressure. Um, and by minimizing this pressure, you, you're minimizing over distension uh, and lung injury. However, it's hard to measure a pleural pressure. Um, you, you could put a catheter in the pleural space, I suppose, but the, the way that's generally accepted is to use an esophageal balloon uh, in that we measure esophageal pressures and that's a surrogate for, um, for uh, uh, pleural pressures. This is what a, one of those esophageal balloons looks like. It's basically an NG tube that has a, um, two balloons, one for the esophagus, one for the stomach, and it has a, a pressure uh, transducer, um, and also has an NG uh, line. Um, this was studied where they compared esophageal balloon to high peep, but they did not show any um, difference. I think the, the patients where it probably does make um, uh, more of a difference is in, in those with morbid obesity or chest wall abnormalities, where um, that plateau pressure um, or the pressure that's being delivered is not, um, uh, is, some of it's being used to distend the chest wall itself. Um, so one, uh, I don't know if they have an example of that here. This is kind of the opposite example for, so this is someone, um, oh, this, this would be the example here. So this is someone with a stiff chest wall um, and basically the, you know, you're giving uh, alveolar pressure, plateau pressure is 30, um, but a significant amount of that is being used to distend the chest wall itself and therefore the difference between the two is minimized. And the same thing could be true with the obesity. So the, you're using a significant amount of pressure just to uh, overcome their obesity and the trans pulmonary pressure is actually fairly small despite having a, a, a fairly high plateau pressure. Uh, the opposite example could be, uh, or another example could be a trumpet, think of a trumpet player um, uh, playing a note. They have exceedingly high uh, pressure, uh, alveolar pressures, but they also have very high plateau pressures because they're contracting their respiratory muscles and, the plat and they don't get pneumothoraces all the time because the transpulmonary pressure uh, is pretty small. Um, and the other end of the spectrum, and we see this quite a bit, is say you have someone on non-invasive and they're, they're working really hard, they're sucking in, uh, taking deep breaths, they're generating well, large negative pressures uh, within the plural space. Um, and then we're delivering positive pressure and then and they have a, a very high transpulmonary pressure. So it's a, a potential um, setup for lung injury and pneumothorax, et cetera. So something to be aware of, it's not something um, that we, we don't use as optical balloons here in, in clinical practice, but I think at least thinking about this in your obese patients or patients with chest wall abnormalities, that that plateau pressure may not um, accurately represent their transpulmonary pressure, which is really what we should care about. All right, um, so moving on to fluids. Um, so. Why do we care about fluids? One, um, lung injury, acute lung injury or ARDS results in this damaged um, endothelium. They may lose this healthy glycochylax, which helps maintain an equilibrium between um, the, um, uh, the blood vessel and the interstitium. When this is damaged, it become, the endothelium becomes leaky and fluid leaks across. So the, the fear is that the lung uh, has a damaged endothelium and the more fluid you give, the more it's gonna leak across into the interstitial and alveolar spaces and then you get worse, you get a stiffer lung and then oxygenation gets worse as well. Um, this was studied in the FACT trial, which was done in 2006. Um, they had a thousand patients with, and they used the, the consensus definition, so with acute lung injury and they had conservative versus liberal management for seven days or when they came off mechanical ventilation. The protocol is here, it's fairly complicated, but basically you start with um, their MAP. If they have a MAP um, greater than 60, you look at their urinary output and then decide if they have uh, an effective or effective uh, circulation. And then if they are in, uh, you give, either give Lasix, um, Lasix and dobutamine, um, and then um, or fluids. 
So, and they also used um, uh, invasive measurements, CDP, you know, all my pollution pressures. Go we'll cool. watch it the second time, it'll be the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this, basically what happened at the end of the trial was that uh, the, con um, the conservative fluid group used a lot more Lasix. So I think, and think about how much Lasix we gave, this, they gave up to 150, or on average, 150 milligrams daily. And they had a, a more of a net fluid, uh, net negative fluid balance, of negative 500 versus 500. And uh, they ended up doing a lot better. They were on the ventilator less, um, they got out of the ICU faster, Interestingly, there was no difference in kidney failure um, between uh, the groups. The difference in mortality, however, was non-significant. But um, and this again shows uh, their main outcomes. So there was a there was an absolute difference in mortality, but it just didn't re reach um, statistic uh, significance. Um, All right, so moving on to paralysis or um, neuromuscular blockade. So why do we do this? Um, I think there's two big reasons. One is for vent synchrony. Um, we care about vent synchrony because of the reasons we just discussed. We, we don't want them to get high tidal volumes or, or grip, uh, high transpulmonary pressures or high plateaus, et cetera. Um, this is a ventilator waveform where you can see that the patient is what we call double triggering, or basically taking two breaths when they're supposed to be only taking one. Um, and this usually occurs when you're limiting tidal volume and the patient just wants, uh, wants more volume. So they continue to uh, inhale after, um, after the breath has ended and then the machine, not realizing, uh, delivers a second breath before the patient exhales. And basically they're getting two, double the tidal volume that you have set. Um, and you know, likely are not getting their six to eight cc's per kg. So this is potentially injurious and, and can be avoided with paralysis. The second reason um, for hypoxemia is when a patient is paralyzed, they use less oxygen. Um, so there's the oxy oxygen consumption is significantly lower. Um, and so if you have someone with refractory hypoxemia, uh, sometimes paralysis uh, can help improve uh, improve that uh, simply by um, decreasing oxygen demand. Um, okay, and there's there are two important studies on paralysis that you should at least be aware of. One was the Accurus trial in 2010. Uh, this showed a significant uh, decrease in mortality and the patients who re uh, received uh, 48 hours of paralytic with cis uh, uh, compared to placebo. Uh, it was a little bit odd that the, more, that the survival curves diverged after 20 days, but nevertheless, this is what led to the fairly widespread adaptation of uh, using paralytic and in ARDS and using it more upfront rather than a salvage uh, therapy. Um, however, a second trial uh, rose in 2019, again, looked at a very similar protocol of, of cisatricarium for 48 hours versus not, and they found no, um, no significant difference um, in mortality. And I think, um, I'm going to skip this slide, actually. I think when, we, when you weigh, you know, Right now, because of these conflicting studies, um, I think you, what you have to do for each patient is weigh the pros and cons of why you're going to give a paralytic. Um, one is yeah, obviously the pros are vent synchrony. So individually, is the patient having sync? Are they synchronous or not? Um, and maybe you can get away with less sedation. You know, I think you reach a point with sedation um, that you can no longer, or you won't be able to suppress uh, their respiratory uh, drive and you should just paralyze them as opposed to cranking up Versed or, or fentanyl or something. Um, another pro is it's very easy to monitor their compliance and their lung function because the, you take the patient out of the equation, it's just their lung and the ventilator 
Um, and you wonder if certain patients, maybe those with high levels of dyssynchrony, have um, a mortality benefit despite the ROSE trial um, being uh, negative. Uh, the cons would include increased weakness and myopathy, but I think it's really hard to tell um, which, um, you know, if, if this is true because paralytic or because of extremely high levels of sedation. But I think you, you need to, uh, paralytics really should be reserved for those with significant uh, dyssynchrony um, or those with refractory hypoxemia rather than giving everyone with ARDS a paralytic. All right, so moving on to pulmonary vasodilators. So um, these are um, drugs which selectively vasodilate the pulmonary um, circulation. And we give those an inhaled way. And the, the reason we do it inhaled is that um, the drug is only delivered to ventilate, uh, ventilated lung units, as opposed to the non-ventilated lung units, which you would not want to increase blood flow to. So you're selectively increasing blood flow to lung units, which are being ventilated and therefore oxygenated, and hopefully improving VQ matching across the lung and improving hypoxemia. However, there's really a paucity of um, data uh, for pulmonary vasodilators. There's really only two great uh, randomized studies. Uh, there was a, a Cochrane review of this, they made no recommendation for or against. Um, and some studies actually found that mortality increased with pulmonary vasodilators. Um, this hasn't been studied, but perhaps uh, there, there may be a more of a benefit in those patients with um, pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction. Uh, that's more of a theoretical um, than something that's been studied. But anyways, I think um, pulmonary vasodilators at this point um, should be reserved for or more as a salvage therapy rather than an upfront therapy um, for ARDS. All right, so moving on to steroids. So I think there's a lot of conflict with steroids in ARDS. Um, the SCCM guidelines do suggest using steroids with early on uh, with moderate to severe ARDS. Um, and they also recommend using steroids for pneumonia. However, IDSA recommends against using steroids for pneumonia. And then if you have influenza causing ARDS, they recommend, they recommend against using steroids. And then the same can be said for aspiration. So um, I think steroids, the use of steroids in ARDS is, is somewhat based on uh, or is kind of an individual um, decision. At least in the COVID patients, there's good data to support using steroids, but uniformly using steroids in every patient with ARDS is, uh, I don't think there's great data for. Um, so it, it should be really select patients rather than, than uh, every single patient with ARDS that you see. There, this was a, a fairly recent study that did support using ARDS, uh, steroids in ARDS. This was really prior to um, COVID, but um, this was the DEXA ARDS trial, which was published in the Lancet, and they had 277 patients, so relatively small, um, and they looked at giving dexamethasone in ARDS, and they found a significant improvement um, in um, ventilator-free days and mortality. So this supports using steroids but, um, in, in, in this group of patients. All right. So moving on to ECMO in uh, ARDS. Um, so what is ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation? Basically, this is cardiopulmonary or pulmonary bypass. Um, so you're using, uh, you have a circuit, and the, the most common uh, ECMO modality that you're going to use for ARDS would be um, what's called VV or uh, uh, venous ECMO, where you're taking blood um, from the venous circulation, it's running through a pump and an oxygenator, and then it's going back, um, back in, again, into the venous circulation, and then being pumped by the heart through the lungs and to the left side and then to the rest of the body. Um, there's different ways, kind of setups to do that. You can either go through the internal jugular and femoral veins or go through um, uh, the um, 
internal jugular with a dual lumen uh, catheter. And essentially the blood is being taken from, at least in this setup, from the femoral approach from the IBC and then delivered to the um, uh, right atrium. And this setup, um, the catheter is, is taking blood from the right atrium and then is delivering it uh, really towards the right ventricle. Um, there's there's a few studies of ECMO and ARDS. The, the most recent and largest was the OLEA trial. Um, this was 249 patients with severe ARDS. Um, there was a trend towards um, improved survival in the ECMO group, although there was no um, uh, uh, there's no statistical uh, difference. Um, there was crossover from the control group, so there are a select group of patients that had refractory hypoxemia and were moved from control to ECMO. I think air, uh, ECMO at this point for ARDS is generally considered uh, salvage therapy. Um, I think if, if you guys have any experience with this, you, you generally tend to trade one set of problems for another set of problems. Um, there's probably some individual patients that will benefit from ECMO, um, especially if they're started on ECMO early on their course rather than uh, later. Okay, so moving on to COVID. I think um, COVID, at least initially, there was a lot of controversy of, of whether or not COVID pneumonia was ARDS or not. It, you know, it fulfilled the um, general criteria, the Berlin criteria for ARDS, you know, with the bilateral infiltrates and hypoxemia. However, um, in many cases, or what was noted, was that the compliance was relatively preserved in the COVID patients, and perhaps there were different phenotypes uh, of COVID pneumonia in this guy, uh, Gattinoni, uh, He's, he's pretty famous in the pulmonary world. Uh, Italian doctor was uh, pushed this idea of different um, phenotypes and uh, there being a high and a low compliance uh, phenotype. And basically he, he studied this and found that there was a dissociation between the degree of hypoxemia and the compliance of the lung relative to traditional ARDS. Um, so he was questioning, you know, was is this two different disease processes or the same disease with what you think of traditional ARDS to be? However, they might have the same level of hypoxia. Um, and one theory that was pushed out was that perhaps these patients, the type one patients, had um, had uh, alterations in hypoxemic phase of constriction, so they were shunting. Um, the same process um, that is occurring at different point, points, um, that type 1 ultimately may go to type 2 over time if they, if they don't improve, and sometimes hopefully the type 1s um, won't ever get to type 2 and will, and will improve before that. Um, okay. All right, so I think there's still, there's obviously still a lot of questions in future um, research uh, areas for uh, ARDS. One is using ultra low tidal volumes with extracorporeal CO2 removal. So this is basically using tidal volumes like four cc's per kg. So, uh, you know, like 200 cc tidal volumes um, and, then, and then having like an ECMO circuit that removes um, carbon dioxide. Um, you can actually do this with a, um, uh, with like a dialysis type setup. So you don't need as large cannula. Um, so that's one area of research. Another idea is, is doing awake ECMO. So this is instead of intubating someone, um, you, you have a patient that has ARDS and they're on high flow and you cannulate them for, for ECMO without ever intubating them. Uh, and then they're on very little sedation or no sedation um, and um, they can avoid delir you know, hopefully they avoid delirium and the weakness that comes along with prolonged uh, sedation and intubation. Um, I think this has been, we tried something along, at least when I was at hospital center, we tried to do this. Um, it, it can be a challenge, I think, partly because of the SERS response, at least with COVID, um, that you know, it, it just causes a lot of issues. But anyhow, yeah. um, timing of intubation. So there's, it's unclear when patients should be intubated. 
Um, I think this came up with, or the pendulum has swung from one end to the other, at least with COVID, where you know initially we were intubating almost everyone, um, at least you know on six liters of oxygen nasal cannula they'd get intubated, to now we we often let people stay on non-invasive for days and days, um, and it's unclear when the best time would be uh, to intubate um, to prevent lung injury. Um, Using non-invasive or BiPAP or CPAP in ARDS is, is relatively unstudied. Um, I think the concern with using BiPAP is you can't control tidal volumes quite as well, and you can have um, huge swings in transpulmonary pressure that you can't uh, account for or control with sedation or, or paralysis. Um, so non-invasive isn't really recommended for ARDS, but it's, it's relatively unstudied. Uh, there's this idea of self-proning, which has come up uh, out of the COVID um, pandemic. Um, so this is proning prior to intubation while the patient is on high flow. Um, and, and hopefully that's improving recruitment and hypoxemia and avoid, you know, helps avoid intubation. I think there's still a paucity of data about this. Um, I think Jake, Jake Bell, one of the fellows, is looking into this here. Um, and then there's this idea of ARDS phenotypes, um, whether this is uh, like an immuno, uh, immunologic phenotype um, or, or something else yet to be defined uh, that you know, people are, are studying different, you know, how, how different people respond uh, to ARDS and, and perhaps have been, individual therapies can come out of that. So this is just a short list of um, some things that are ongoing in the ARDS world. 